Um, so I think um, the definition of tainters is, is important. And the question is, um, do we have a good definition? Do we need a better definition? What do we, um, what have we done in order to come up with a, with a good definition? So um, it's a kind of a dry topic, but um, I hope that I can convince you that it's an important topic and we will try to discuss some important aspects. So why do we need a commonly accepted definition of tinnitus? First, in principle, a definition is a necessary precondition for all kinds of research. If we want to research a topic, we have to know what we are talking about. What do we mean if we, need, if we use a certain term? So I think in order to be able to um, research on a certain topic, we need a clear definition. And this should be commonly accepted because if everybody um, understand something else with the same term, so we have a problem. Moreover, um, in all health systems in the world, um, there is a need to place the different symptoms and disorders in categories and in systems. And there's different um, international um, systems of classification of disorders, like the WHO, um, uh, uh, system, the international classification of diseases, or for brain disorders, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders. So also here, we, we need a clear definition um, in order to have a correct placement of the um, disease or the disorder or a symptom in these classifications. Because based on these classifications, all the health systems work, so all the um, reimbursement is organized and so on. And, and I think that's also a very important aspect if we want to do epidemiological research, if we want to learn more about risk factors uh, for tinnitus, what causes tinnitus, what is the cause of tinnitus over time, we need to have a commonly accepted definition. Because um, at the moment, if you look into the literature about prevalence rates of tinnitus, there's a large variety in the different studies. And probably the most important factor for this vari variability is that all the different researchers use somewhat different definitions um, of tinnitus. We, we need to, this research also in order to make clear how important tinnitus is, what is the socioeconomic relevance of tinnitus. So we need a clear um, definition. If we come up with uh, very variable numbers, nobody will trust in our numbers. And for sure, the, all these classifications are also important for um, discussions with health insurances and healthcare regulators concerning reimbursement, um, uh, treatment systems um, um, for, for tinnitus. So I think it's extremely important and therefore we have to discuss, to think about it. Um, this has also been expressed in a very, very good paper coming out two years ago from a group of authors from Great Britain, from an ENT, uh, Don McFerrin is an ENT, the representative of a patient um, interest groups, David Stockdale, Charles Lart from the industry, David Bakley, um, who also uh, joins us today as an audiologist. And they discussed all the shortcomings in tinnitus, such as why there is no cure, cure for tinnitus. And um, you see many people have downloaded this, this paper. It's really um, recommendable. And associated with this paper, the British Tinnitus Association came up with a kind of a tinnitus cure map. And you see it's, it's a large map and um, it's more or less a to-do list for the tinnitus research community. What is important in order to move tinnitus research forward? And on this large map, you find um, on the top definitions. We need a clear definition for tinnitus and for tinnitus cure. So this was also the reason or one of the reasons that within the tinnitus research initiative, we made an effort, we tried to bring um, renowned tinnitus clinicians and researchers together um, to come up with a consensus for a proposal um, for a definition of tinnitus. And so we had a lot, a very constructive and active interaction and discussion. And we realized that it's really um, an important topic and a topic where, um, yeah, there's different approaches and also different opinions. Um, definitely a project which is um, just uh, initiated and not yet. Um, finished, but um, I think we came up at least with a certain consensus for the, um, for the moment. 
So this was an issue. So this this effort was from the Team to Research Initiative, which um, exists in order to move Team to Research forward, in order to bring researchers and clinicians from all over the world together. And so we came up with this consensus. So we differentiated between tinnitus and tinnitus disorder. Tinnitus, according to our definition, is a conscious awareness of a tonal or composite noise for which there's no identifiable corresponding external sound source. So it means there's a tonal percept or a, um, non tonal percept in the brain without a um, corresponding sound source. The tinnitus disorder is the same associated with emotional and or cognitive dysfunction, autonomic arousal, leading to behavioral changes and functional disability. So all these reactions to tinnitus have been um, the, the core of the def definition of tinnitus disorder. So tinnitus as a percept alone, all the emotional behavioral reactions um, are summarized in the term tinnitus disorder. So here we have, in addition to the conscious perception of the sound, we have an emotional reaction and the behavioral reaction, behavioral changes associated to the tinnitus. So going back to the first part of the tinnitus percept, what does this um, mean? We say it's a tonal or composite noise. And this definition wants to differentiate from auditory hallucinations. So this is typically voices that are perceived by patients with schizophrenia. So this is not tinnitus. So this is a very important distinction. And um, we also wanted to distinguish it from musical hallucinations or the perception of music. It's um, probably pathophysiologically uh, somewhat associated and related to, to tinnitus, but according to this definition, as, as soon as someone hears music, it's musical hallucinations and not tinnitus. Um, the, we formulated the definition, there's no identifiable corresponding external sound source, which means people who perceive a sound which is internally generated, this is also tinnitus. Typically, we differentiate subjective and objective tinnitus. Objective tinnitus is also a, probably a better term is somato sounds. These are sounds that are produced within the body. So why did we decide to subsummarize this um, all under tinnitus and not um, differentiate it from the very beginning? The reason is a very practical reason. Because if a patient comes to our clinic and we report about tinnitus, at this moment, we don't know yet whether it's subjective tinnitus whether there's no sound source at all, or whether it's objective tinnitus, which means that there might be an internal sound source. Um, and we also exclude, we exclude with this definition the perception of low, low frequency sounds from the environment. Um, probably you know these patients who come to the tinnitus clinic and they report that they, they can perceive a low frequency hum under certain conditions. And which other people cannot perceive. And it turns out that this seems to be a real sound coming from some generators, from some um, uh, industry um, uh, in, in, the, in the environment. So these are real sounds and they are perceived by people who are particularly, particularly sensitive to that. So this is not tinnitus. Going back to the um, objective tinnitus, typically this could be a vascular origin which causes the sound we know it's fundamentally different from subjective tinnitus, but in many cases, we are not sure whether it's objective or subjective tinnitus. We assume that somebody with a pulsatile tinnitus might have objective tinnitus, but we cannot identify a sound source with um, MRI angiography or um, other forms of angiography. So therefore, we decided that we put objective and subjective tinnitus together in the, division, uh, in the definition even if we know that these are fundamentally different um, pathologies. So in contrast to tinnitus, tinnitus disorder now means that the perception of the sound is associated with emotional and or cognitive dysfunction, autonomic arousal, and leads to behavioral changes and functional disability. So why did we um, decide to differentiate between tinnitus and tinnitus disorder? First of all, the experience of tinnitus sound is not the same as the experience of tinnitus sound with associated suffering. Um, many patients come to our clinic and say, when they reported about, or when they told um, friends or uh, family members about their tinnitus, 
how, is it, how much they are suffering, they frequently heard the answer, ah, oh, I also have a sound, I also have tinnitus, but I don't care about it. And for the patient, it's, it's a horrible experience. They suffer a lot, and then somebody else says, oh, I'm the same, but I'm not suffering. So it, it's, it's something which is very different. And I think we have to um, consider this difference and we have to express it in the um, diagnostic classification. Luckily, um, the majority of people who perceive tinnitus are not suffering from it. So we have more people who have the perception of tinnitus, much more people than those who really have tinnitus disorder who are suffering from their tinnitus. But this suffering is um, driven by the emotional and cognitive dysfunction, by the autonomic arousal, by the behavioral change in the functional disability. This is what, what makes tinnitus clinically relevant in most cases. Therefore, we have to take into account these aspects um, by a separate uh, classification. And finally, and this is most important, when we think about diagnostic classification, this should reflect the pathophysiology because um, in, in all forms of mental disorders, we have frequently the difficulty that um, to identify pathophysiological entities or disease entities. In the, in the um, rest of the body, typically we have structural changes and we classify the disorders according to the structural changes. In brain disorders is more, more difficult. We have typically functional changes, but we should try to um, orient our classification according our knowledge of, of the pathophysiology. And we know that people who just perceive a sound differ in their um, imaging um, results, in their neuroimaging results, from those who also suffer from their tinnitus. So this distinction is really reflected by our, our knowledge about the pathophysiology. And finally, we also tried to come up with an analogy to the definition of pain as um, it has been discussed over the last decades by many um, researchers and clinicians that there's many, many analogies between tinnitus and pain. So it's reasonable that our classification is in some accordance to the um, classification of pain. And I will now a little bit um, extend on this analogy between um, pain and tinnitus also to reflect the title um, tinnitus as a pain and brain, the, the brain, pain and brain, the base definition of tinnitus. So our sensory systems are more or less um, organized into two different pathways. So here, um, if you see a snake, one pathway codes for the size of the snake, for the color of the snake, for the position of the snake, for the movement of the snake. This is so-called lateral pathway, which goes to the here, the visual cortex or the um, auditory somatosensory cortex. But then there's another pathway um, and this pathway signals, oh, this is dangerous. You have to do something about it. And this is much faster. And this goes directly here to the amygdala, um, something which is a brain structure, which is related with fear memory, but also with um, autonomic structures, which um, prepare the body to fight or to flight, to do something about it. So I think it's important to know we have these two different pathways. And this is valid for all the different modalities. So we have this so-called lateral pathway that goes to the somatosensory cortex in the uh, situation of pain, to the auditory cortex in the situation of, of tinnitus. And then we have the medial pathway, the fast pathway, which is responsible for our emotional reaction, but also for our um, fight and flight reaction to a certain stimulus. So this is the medial pathway. And in addition, we have a descending pathway, an inhibitory pathway going from the top, from the brain to the structures below in order to inhibit signals in case that they are not so relevant. And this um, mechanism is valid similarly for the somatosensory and the auditory system for pain and for tinnitus. So that's exactly the same mechanism. When we look on imaging data, we can differentiate the activation that is induced by pain into an activation of the somatosensory system um, and an activation that's a lateral pathway and an activation which is related to suffering, the medial pathway. And also we can identify the structures that are related to this inhibitory pathway. And exactly the same situation is valid for tinnitus, the brain activation um, is a summary or the result of 
the activity of the auditory cortex, which reflects probably the loudness of the um, tinnitus percept, um, combined with the brain structures of the network, which codes the suffering. And this, again, is modulated by inhibitory activity, top-down activity. So this is what we find in neuroimaging, which just um, is the basis of, this, of these three mechanisms that play a role in the perception of pain and tinnitus. Here again, here on the left side, you see the um, activation of the somatosensory cortex or the auditory cortex of the lateral pathway, bottom up ascending. And um, the, what is here coded in green as unpleasantness, that's the medial pathway. And we have the top down um, regulation. And for sure, these two aspects have to interact. And this is probably mainly regulated by the reward system. And the reward system is the system in the brain, which tells us um, something about the importance of the, um, of the different signals that come to the brain. And for sure, this um, system, which uh, codes importance and relevance, also um, modulates the um, descending pathways, which um, are necessary or which are relevant for our overall perception. So what I want to um, explain here very shortly, in the pathophysiology of tinnitus, we have a very close interaction or, or um, analogy to the pathophysiology of, of pain. Therefore, it's really reasonable um, to orient our classification to the established classifications of pain. So in addition, we have some um, conventions that we have to decide about, and these are time criteria. Um, so we adapted here the time criterion, which has been used by, the, by most epidemiological studies, which means tinnitus lasts for minimum five minutes per day and occurs on the majority of days. As mentioned, this is arbitrary, but it's a convention, and we should adapt to uh, some common convention. Um, this is um, derived from epidemiological studies, and it should differentiate from the so-called spontaneous brief unilateral tinnitus. So this term describes that many people report that from time to time they have a short sound on one side, which comes and goes, uh, but it's not regularly, it's not on the majority of days, and this is not the tinnitus. Then we have the differentiation. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I just have to um, remind you, we have a, a couple of minutes left. Uh, so I'm, I'm almost done. I'm yes, done. Oh, just, just a reminder. Yeah. Thank you. That's the differentiation between acute and chronic tinnitus. Acute a duration of less than three months, chronic more than three months. And um, this differentiation is important because acute tinnitus can be a symptom of an underlying problem, whereas chronic tinnitus typically is the primary problem. So it also could be named secondary and primary, at least in some cases. The difficulty is we have no empirical evidence for a clear cut of criterion between acute and chronic tinnitus. And um, according to most um, definitions, and also according to the um, differentiation in pain, we decided to um, distinguish, to have to use three months as a cutoff. I think we should be careful when we use these terms in the uh, communication with patients, because for sure they are scared that their acute tinnitus turns into a chronic tinnitus. And we have no uh, real evidence that it makes a difference whether somebody has two months or three months or four months tinnitus. So I think that's more for research purpose for classification, but not for the communication with patients. So this results in the um, proposal for definition for the ICD-11. Um, which is more or less summarized our distinction to one sentence. And also we made a proposal for definition for the DSM-5, the, um, the, the classification of mental disorders, analogy to pain disorders. I, we can go through this very fast. It's more or less three criteria um, describing distressing tinnitus. There's also the criterion persistent, which means it's um, chronic and also severe. And here, according to this definition, the severity is classified by the amount of symptoms specified here. I think it's something we can have a long discussion. We just use the analogy to pain. And we think that this is a proposal, a good suggestion. But for sure, we are open uh, to discussions. And I only want to mention that what I presented here is really work in progress. It's a proposal that we have at the moment 
And I think it's uh, something which should be further developed with input from um, people from different disciplines all over the world. And the TRI will follow this topic up and try to integrate all this input. And now I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs>